I'm Nick Hancock and this is the entrance to Room 101, the warehouse of the worst things in the world. The final resting place of snooker from the crucible, Bovril flavoured crisps, family get-togethers and, of course, Judith Chalmers. <laughs> Each week a guest tries to persuade me that their own most hated objects deserve to be locked away behind the doors. Will I be swayed by their arguments or will they be forced to take their choices back home with them? My guest this week is Ian Hislop. Right, Ian, well, I've got your choices in here. Were there any that uh, just bubbled under, didn't make the final list? Uh, the piano. The film, the piano. Yes. Right. <laughs> I think if there is a room 101, the piano will be playing continuously. <laughs> and at no point will that woman ever drown. <laughs> the bit I wanted her to. Anything I didn't else? like that film no. much. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting that sort of impression. Mm, yeah. Good. Well, let's get on to your first official choice before right. you spill too much bile unnecessarily. No, no. Um, <laughs> plenty to go. <laughs> I wanted to have Angus Deaton's voice put in. <laughs> That's uh, so we never have to listen to it again. <laughs> Hello, have you invested in South Africa recently? <laughs> well, your first choice is a television programme, and yes. indeed its host, who's a genuine lovely man who brings sunshine into our lives every morning. I can hardly wait to see him again. Let's have him straight away. <laughs> And casually lean against the camera there. It's pure sex, isn't it? Oh, his chest, look! <laughs> Hello, and good morning. We have the most incredible stories this morning about love, or more particularly, first love. Is first love the only true love, or can we all love as much a number of times? <laughs> Good question, Robert, yeah. eh? What a great bloke. If it, ever there it, was... has, it, it has to be said that his first love was himself. Obviously. <laughs> I don't think he's ever fallen out of love. A real long laster. Yeah, I think if, uh, if ever there was a, a case for relaxing this country's gun laws, then Kilroy's <laughs> there. <laughs> so, um, what, I... are you, what are your particular problems with him? Well, I, I walk to Clapham Junction in the mornings to get a train and there's a, sh a Granada shop opposite me and it just has hundreds of television with Kilroy on it. Right. And I walk past every morning and there's a sort of vision of hell hundreds of Kilroys and they're always saying usually the sounds off but he's usually saying so so how do you feel about that <laughs> so someone murdered your children so how did that make you feel <laughs> what you feel bad about that <laughs> well actually I've got the people who killed them here <laughs> let's have a debate that'd be really good and everyone always has a good point don't they yep everyone's got a good point we believe the earth is flat good point mm. Galilee <laughs> what do you think <laughs> So you'd string them up by their balls. Good point, oh, good yeah. point. You wouldn't. You'd sort of help them out a bit. Bit of therapy. Good. Yeah, well, we're really getting somewhere here. We've got a little chart here <laughs> of uh, how Kilroy prepares for his show. Um, this is the amount of time he spends on researching the subject, and this is the amount of time he spends on a sunbed. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, he's... he's <laughs> He's so incredibly smooth, isn't he? Every time he sort of sidles up to one of the people there, I think he's going to try and sell them a fitted kitchen. <laughs> I don't think we're going to let um, Kilroy into Room 101. For, Why? Well, it's for two reasons, really. Firstly, I think that his programme is very good therapy for people who need it, most uh, specifically him. And <laughs> secondly, I think Kilroy works really, really well at dissuading young children from watching daytime television. <laughs> So we're not going to let it in, so you have to take something home with you. So we've had specially made up Him. this beautiful... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a Kilroy pillow and duvet set. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know what it's like to be Mrs Kilroy. <laughs> I think that's a real passion killer, isn't it? So you have to take that one home with you, I'm afraid. It's like those yes and no's. So I just put yes or... <laughs> <laughs> So pop that into your bag, and right. uh, it's your least favourite place now, and I think this is a little hard. It's a, a charming village in rural England. What's the name of the village? Greendale. Greendale, a lovely village. Let's, let's see a little bit of footage from the Greendale uh, archive. <laughs> Have a good day, Pat. I will. Cheerio. Now listen to Miss Hubbard. Morning, Miss Hubbard. Morning, Pat. She's a man! <laughs> 
<laughs> Miss Hubbard is definitely the village transvestite. There's no doubt about that. If only it were that interesting. <laughs> Hold tight, Jess. You're going to see some pretty hot driving now. <laughs> <laughs> Pat delivered his letters all along the valley. But not to the houses. <laughs> now, a very harsh choice, Ian. Talk us through it. What's the problem? Um, there are a lot of books I've always wanted to read more than once, mm -hmm. but Postman Pat's Sleepy Days isn't one of them. Right. Um, and as many other parents will find, that I've read this book 3,488 times. <laughs> I feel I live in Greendale. <laughs> Me, Miss Hubbard. Oh, it's Hubbard, is it? Hubbard, oh, yes. Okay, <laughs> Dorothy Thompson, the twins, you know them all. <laughs> Ted Bloody Glenn. <laughs> Postman Pat delivering those boring old letters. He never seems to do any of the things that normal postmen do, like, you know, intercepting a couple of gyros <laughs> or... Uh... <laughs> or, or, uh, or chucking the post behind a hedge and going to the racing at Newbury. <laughs> That's another thing about Greendale, there isn't a pub there. I find that very strange in a lovely English village. There should definitely be a pub. Yeah, but no one would go to it because they're too dull. What they like is cups of tea. Mm. You obviously never read any of these. No. Mrs. Goggins, you go in, you get a cup of tea. Dorothy Thompson, you go in, you get a cup of tea. Mm. Reverend Timms, go in, get a cup of tea. I also think Pat should get sacked. We had a look at that clip there. Now, there's two things that happen. If we can see it again, he's That's coming. An action replay. Yeah, he's coming up here to a crossroads, OK? He's going to turn right. And he doesn't indicate. Oh. <laughs> That's terrible. And also, it says it's a crossroads, but straight ahead there's a house. <laughs> I don't understand that. That's very peculiar, because he actually wins a prize for driving in one of the stories. Well, exactly. First you know... prize for driving, actually. Absolutely terrible. There he goes. Anyway. <laughs> you can't just produce this and expect me not to play with it. It is great, isn't it? We've got this one as well that walks. Look at that. <laughs> All right, well, pick it up. Pick it up, Mr. Hislop, because I think we will send Postman Pat into room 101 for all those hey! days. All those parents that have had to suffer reading him over and over and over again. Now, when reading we Reading him? I've been to the Postman Pat village in Longleat. <laughs> forget the lions, forget the interesting house, you go around Greendale again. <laughs> Hello, Pat. It's a, it's a Postman Pat theme park, really. Well, it's a sort of little park, just uh, behind Longleat. Oh, that's excellent. I've seen the stage show. They should have more that's of it. That's a cracker. <laughs> <laughs> now, um... When we send these into Room 101, you have to have a little listen out because uh, Radio Room 101 will be playing in there with sort of right. a loop of all the worst uh, songs possible. And so listen out for that as we send Postman Pat into Room 101. Wave, boys and girls. <laughs> Suzanne takes you down to a place near. Do you recognise that particular song? Yes, that's um, Leonard Cohen. Right. <laughs> Laughing Boy Leonard Cohen. Yep. Are you a fan of his? <laughs> um, well, when I was um, sort of sad and depressed in the sick form and reading T.S. Eliot, mm. pretending to understand it, I used to listen to Leonard Cohen. Mm. I think him and Janice Ian are probably responsible for more suicides than anybody else <laughs> in the world. <laughs> Your next choice, uh, this feels like a bit of a jealousy deal to me. This is uh, one of Private Eye's main highbrow competitors, so let's bring it round. Hello. <laughs> it's me you're for. Oh, they recognised it. <laughs> yeah, this is my favourite magazine. <laughs> the House Journal of Crooks and Divorcees. We're trying to work out what would be their, their perfect uh, interviewee, and we decided probably some sort of mid European princess who'd got a lot of money, but also had lost a leg in a bizarre roulette wheel injury. <laughs> that, would, that would be the perfect thing for them, wouldn't it? It, it? it represents, I think, everything that I've tried not to do in journalism my whole life. They have a nose for a celebrity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll buy that. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. No, Nick, <laughs> no, I agree. Can't argue with half a million sales. <laughs> um, think... they, they did a particularly fine one with a man called Darius Guppy. 
Mm. And um, the opening question was, Darius, you've had a, a really bad press recently, haven't you? And you thought, well, no, not really. He's been sent to jail for fraud. Yeah. <laughs> and you've gone and interviewed him in his cell. Mm. The reason he had a bad press is because he was put away. <laughs> Their sort of line of questioning has always been, you're very, very beautiful and talented. How are you such a good mother as well? Yeah. Oh, we've... <laughs> I think we've standard hello questions. We've got a list of their questions here, actually. We've picked out some, some of the best ones. Um, how would you sum yourself up, would you say? That's one of their favourite <laughs> ones. Do you want to have a go at that? Terrific. It's usually the answer. <laughs> what is a typical day for you? Well, I avoid bankruptcy in the morning and um, <laughs> I take my eighth wife to Aspen in the afternoon <laughs> and go it. skiing with Di. I'd like to see them do Mother Teresa of Calcutta. <laughs> You're a tremendously successful woman, but also a wife to God. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do yeah. it? How do you find catering for a man who's omnipotent <laughs> and omnipresent? <laughs> but uh, I think we have got a sneak preview of uh, next month's edition. <laughs> Britain's sharpest satirist explains his charity work and hatred for the government. Ian Hislop at his country home. All Here right, I take it all back. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel, I feel it's only fair to send hello in, even though my mother will kill me because it's comfortably her favourite magazine. So we'll pop these up here. I expect you want to take that one home that we've mocked up there. Don't you? <laughs> no, you can keep that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That'd be good if someone found that in your house, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a little listen to what's playing and bye bye, hello. She may be the face <laughs> that I can't forget. It dress of And we move on to the next choice. Now, this is, um, well, the best way of describing it is that there's one word, isn't there, that links Richard Branson, Rolf Harris, and Jimmy Hill. No, um, <laughs> well, it's not that word. Let, let's, let's, let's bring this round and it should explain what the word is. Mm, give me a head with hair. Long, beautiful hair. Shining, beaming, streaming, flax and wax. OK, so, Ian, it is your choice. Beards. Men with beards, presumably. <laughs> no, just beards just generally. Beards and... <laughs> Women with beards I feel much the same about. OK. <laughs> Now, is this an involved and sophisticated argument or just a gut reaction? No, just don't like beards. OK. <laughs> you can't trust men who've got them. They're obviously trying to hide something, aren't they? Uh, my grandmother used to say they look as if they're trying to grow their own balaclava. <laughs> <laughs> she used to say some very strange things. Well, little boys in uh, the last century used to run along in the street behind men with beards and shout, Beaver! <laughs> Could do that now, of course. <laughs> No, not really. Um, but it was a way of dissuading them socially from growing this hair. Mm. Which I think is fair enough, cos you look at, say, Sir Peter Hall or Trevor Nunn and you think, you may be a very good director, but, oh, look, there's a man with a beard here. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> you should have had a little look round before you started, shouldn't you? This Sorry. is also an observable phenomenon. I'm glad that they've actually brought in a head without any hair, because yeah. this is a very usual deal, isn't it? It is. You grow a beard when you're bald. Yeah. <laughs> and then you go to parties and stand upside down and hope no one knows it. <laughs> but beards can improve some people. Um, here's a man who... <laughs> you see less of him. <coughs> Do you want to try that one on? There's one for you. Yes, I think that looks if good. If we're going to discuss it, we should show that we're willing to have a go. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I like that. You think I'd get to direct at the national? <laughs> I'm not really sure about beards. I'm not really sure whether your argument's strong enough that you just don't like it's it. It's not an argument. It's just a tool. It's well, a that... bit of straightforward bigotry. You should. <laughs> Can we not have that in room 101? I'm not going to let. Uh, I'm not going to let beards in because oh. men with beards have to do very important but menial jobs that that people without beards can't do, uh, like. Um, Teaching on the Open University. <laughs> um, drinking real ale. Yep. Reading The Guardian. Yeah, and taking geography lessons. So, uh, <laughs> all those things are essential tasks that have to be done by people with beards, so I'm afraid you're going to have to take the beards home with you as well. You fail oh. again, I'm sorry. Oh. Them's the rules. Into the bag they go. <laughs> right. You're doing quite well out of this programme. George Bernard Shaw comes with me. <laughs> All right, it's a film choice now. Now, oh, what, right. what is your cinematic Giles Brandreth, would you say? <laughs> well, it is, it is a tough toss-up between the piano and this, right. um, obviously. But in the end, I had to go for Truly Madly Deeply. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
It's a you can choice. argue all you like. It's got nothing to do with you. Because I have to say, I'm absolutely with you on this. And uh, there is a scene, isn't there? The worst scene, I think, in cinema history. <laughs> For those of you who just said ah, oh, I want you to remember that as, as we have a look at this scene. Oh, this is my shortest ever date. Yours? Yes. That's something, then. You interested in my last name? Or... No, no, no. Hang on, hang on. Stop. What? OK, OK, no. This is what we do. I tell you everything about my life between here and uh, that statue there. You see it? And then you tell me yours, OK? And we hop, of course. No lies from the speaker, no interruptions, no questions from the listener. And we're off. Mark Damien de Grumwald, 32 next birthday, born bubbly soul. A uh, Capricorn. I don't believe in star signs, I mean. Uh, parents alive, retired, uh, father silent, practically completely silent, uh, 18 years older than my mother, who is not uh, completely silent. Um, owned a mill, then a post office, then a tea shop, uh, amateur magician, father that is, and uh, I was his assistant at uh, conservative club dinner dances, uh, regularly sawn in half from the age of seven, and made to disappear in ideologically unsound circumstances. Please! <laughs> I think, let's say now, it's going to go into room 101. Oh, good, good. There we go. <laughs> not, no, not before... <laughs> not, not before a very long and very comprehensive hatchet job is done on it. <laughs> let's, let's say, first of all, what it's a film about. It's about um, a translator and a social worker mm. and a cellist who is dead. Mm. <laughs> in North London, that's yeah. very important. It's a sort of you've got a, you've got because a it's a British film. It would have to be set in North London. <laughs> to set I... it anywhere else might <laughs> might almost be interesting. Mm. So it's not, and he's a cellist. Yeah, so absolutely. you can play cello music during it. I've actually seen episodes of Star Trek where I've had more in common with the characters. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely terrible. Well, but... the Klingons mainly. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> any of them. Mm. You tell us, give us your well, reasons. It came out about the same time as a film called Ghost. Mm -hmm. They both had a similar theme, um, a loved one dying, trying to come to terms with it. You'd think, well, a British film might tackle that comprehensively and interestingly, the American film would be crass. No, what happens? Ghost, absolute cracker, truly madly, deeply. Oh, no, it's that lot in North London again. <laughs> what happens in the afterlife? Oh, ghosts sit around in North London discussing art house movies with each other. <laughs> They, I remember, it them, was deep I remember them saying at the time that it, that it was a very worthy and very important film, and I am I am willing to believe that it must have been of some help, you know, to other translators who were being pestered by their dead cellist husbands. Mm. <laughs> but basically, not pestered enough, I think, was no, the story. Just not important. No, I don't think that's important at all. This is how important uh, it was and how much social value it's got. <laughs> if this is how important um, the film Truly Madly Deeply is. Mm. This is catchphrase with uh, Roy Walker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'd say. I think if I was to change the film, I would, I would perhaps leave that scene in. But what I'd do if... And I we're keep on. this bit the same. Mark Damien have him doing the hopping because birthday, born That's embarrassing for him. <laughs> and then I'd stop it there. And then she'd say, I never, ever want to see you again. <laughs> and then the credits would roll. Yeah, good. <laughs> Surely the best way of doing it. Here they are, here are the guilty parties. Juliet Stevenson. Oh. I can't believe you're saying, ah. Oh. Absolutely pathetic, isn't it? Let's pop them up here. They're certainly going to go in. And I think with them, we should also put in the... Uh, here it is. There's the screenplay. You can buy that if you want. <laughs> and there's the video. We're going to send them in. Don't forget to have a little listen to Radio Room 101 as we say goodbye and, indeed, good riddance to Truly Madly Deeply. Sunrise, she bringing the morning. Sunrise, bringing the morning. And obviously, Rolf's in there because he's got a beard. So <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not even going to bother to answer that. He's only just got in there and already he's cut a single. I don't know. <laughs> right, it's a book next. Your next choice uh, is a book, and it's one with all the class character and indeed charm of its author, I believe. So let's bring it round. <laughs> well, that's got him back on board quick enough, hasn't it? Yes. Um, Edwina Curry's new novel. 
um, A Parliamentary Affair, which is an extraordinary book. And the lead character is a woman called uh, Elaine Stalker, who shouldn't be confused with Edwina Curry. Mm -hmm. Because Elaine Stalker's uh, very good looking, very sexy, very talented, <laughs> very good at self promotion, and um, bears remarkable similarity to Mrs. Curry, but isn't, obviously. Because she wouldn't have been so crass just to write a book puffing herself up as a brilliant person. <laughs> she wouldn't have done that. <laughs> so that's clear. Mm -hmm. There was an interview uh, with her uh, just after she'd finished it where she, she does draw a brilliant comparison between herself uh, and another author, which we've actually got, if you can see this. Arrogant or what? A little bit like George Eliot, I created a character with some of my characters and personalities, as she did with Dorothea in Middlemarch, and then sort of set her walking to see what would happen, put her into circumstances and situations I'd never experienced, and then found, I suspect a bit like George Eliot herself did, that I got a bit exasperated with her for doing such stupid things at various points. That's right, because I remember... <laughs> I remember Silas Marner. The cover of Silas Marner was the back of a pair of stockings, wasn't it? Was. <laughs> and there's a couple of scenes in uh, Middlemarch where Dorothea gives someone a blowjob. <laughs> <laughs> the, the author she doesn't compare herself with, um, who was also a politician, is Geoffrey Archer. Mm. Which is probably fair enough, cos... Uh, we have a Geoffrey Archer. Well, I've got a whole stack of MPs' books in here. I think she is the first Roy author Hattersley, to make... Roy Geoffrey Archer, Benjamin Disraeli. Here's a book by a cracking bloke, Robert Kilroy Silk again. <laughs> there he is. And The Palace of Enchantments. Now, what... That's by Douglas Hurd. What I find interesting about that is all those MPs who said they haven't got time to read the Maastricht Treaty... Yeah. <laughs> But they've got time to knock out a novel, haven't they? Mm. And it, it is an extraordinary mixture of prose, the Edwina Curry book. Uh, most of it is um, sort of sex, really. Mm -hmm. But then straight after the sex, you get discussions of uh, the function of select committees. Mm. Or, so, you know, you get the Elaine Stalker character who's just had sex with this chief whip called Roger Dixon. <laughs> case, you know. Clever. And um, then straight after she's done, um, straight after they've been at it, they do literally say, so, Roger, do you think a second revising chamber is really necessary to Parliament? <laughs> well, she does, I mean, she does know sensuality. We, we are very fortunate enough to have a clip of her, of her reading uh, a, a little passage from her book. And I think, well, you'll find this a little bit steamy. <laughs> Elaine finished her drink. Her head was buzzing. Before leaving the commons, she had dabbed her perfume, not demurely, on her wrists, but between her breasts under the soles of her feet, on her belly, below her navel. In the warmth, its sweetness shimmered delicately in the air, like some powerful scotch. Dusk was gathering. In a respectable household, lights would be going on, but not here. <laughs> Of course, of course it goes into Room 101. It'll be a, a fitting... <laughs> a fitting addition to the Room 101 library. We can pop it next to Cider with Rosie. Um, <laughs> there it goes. Get ready to listen to Radio Room 101 as we send in Edwina Curry and a parliamentary affair. Congratulations <laughs> and celebrations when I tell everyone that you're in love with me. Very fitting title for Cliff, that. Congratulations, with which he came second in the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> right, your next choice is a television programme, and this um, is a very good clip. It, it features the television debut of one of our top broadcasting personalities. I don't think we should say anything about it until we see that very first moment. Helping me shoulder the burden of this week's show is a young man whose career began by editing a magazine called Passing Wind. He says he graduated to Private Eye, where he's one of the only people that Richard Ingrams has ever allowed to edit the magazine in his absence. Ian Hislop took on this satirical helmsmanship <laughs> at the tender age of 22. Now older, and no doubt wiser, he'll be introducing our first guest in a few minutes. <laughs> Quite brilliant. <laughs> And showing immediately an aplomb there, straight away. If in doubt, pick your teeth, Ian. That's what I said. And look at the wrong camera. Really Brilliant. Caught in the headlights there, <laughs> weren't you? So, talk us through it. What was it called, first of all? Well, as everyone obviously remembers, that was Steve Taylor. Mm -hmm. The Steve Taylor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> TV Steve TV Taylor. TV Steve Taylor. <laughs> fronting a show called Loose Talk. Yeah. Which, um, 
was on in the early days of Channel 4. Right. It was one of those, let's have a really disorganised show and see what happens. Mm -hmm. He was sort of the Chris Evans of his day. <laughs> Without Chris Evans' talent, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine what that meant. <laughs> and uh, what, what did you have to do apart from sit around picking your teeth? You know? uh, that was the main thing I had to do. <laughs> um, I had to link the show right. um, to a large audience who were all either drunk or stoned. Mm -hmm. And then I had to um, interview various people and uh, talk to a man called Tom Waits, mm. who, um, who'd flown in and had what was called jet lag. Right. <laughs> as <And> celebrities <laughs> call it. <laughs> he'd rolled his own jet lag. He hey? had. <laughs> I think he put a huge amount of jet lag up his nose. <laughs> um, let's let's have a little look of you of you dealing manfully with 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 some weight. I can't believe you're going to show this. I'm bit. afraid we are. Um, oh God! Part of the reason that I'm here uh, is to make it uh, um, clear that I uh, I do have a new piece of work that's out. Mm. Unfortunately, can I suggest uh, you plug it a bit louder? I mean, if that's what you're over here for. The record. I'll plug it my own damn way. It's just very soft. Yeah, well, it's... Oh, I think you can hear me, can you? Yeah, but I'm fairly near. Well... <laughs> Looks around for help. <laughs> Doesn't get me. What an incredible amount of sang froid you had there. You were, Amazing. You... I've yeah. been asked by the producer to say, can you get him to speak up because the audience can't, can't hear him? Yeah. So in a jovial way, I'd said, hey, why don't you plug it a bit louder? <laughs> English he... irony. And he came back with? I'll plug it in my own damn way. <laughs> <laughs> there was a researcher on that programme called Jonathan Ross. <laughs> <laughs> you probably don't remember. Yeah. Um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to let Loose talk in uh, for the simple reason that I don't think you can get away with just coming and dumping that on us. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give you uh, the Loose talk video back. There oh, it goes. God. Just in case you haven't got a copy. And also this lovely Tom Waits doll we've had. <laughs> here, <laughs> which, if you pull this cord at the back, says... I'll plug it my own damn way. <laughs> <laughs> And that was actually your final choice, and you've done particularly well, I think. You've got a selection of things in, most pleasingly, truly, madly, deeply, although you were never really in any I'm trouble. I'm coming round to it now. <laughs> <laughs> you were never... After hearing you for half an hour, I think, I think it's all right, really. <laughs> <laughs> kind of joined the people saying, ah. Oh. <laughs> That's fair enough. Too late now, though. And you're going to have to uh, take quite a few things home with you, so if you'd like to pick up your bag and get ready, then thank you very much to Ian Hislop. And we leave you now with a clip from Room 101 that just had to come out for a final viewing. It's a song and dance routine performed by people who can't sing, can't dance and apparently can't rehearse. Cue the staff of Grace Brothers. <laughs> 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 Stop.